great, uh, done so well because it was a small country church and we sang it to a piano and, a, and an organ. But um, the, the song is true nevertheless because the words are true. And no matter what you're going through in life, no matter the circumstances you face, um, there can be hope and joy because Christ lives. Christ died for sinners and was raised from the dead and is seated now at the right hand of God, interceding for those who trust in him. And it's because of that we have hope, we have joy, no matter our circumstances. Christians are not people who are only happy because life is going good. Christians are people who can be happy in Christ even when life is bad. And it's because of Christ. And it's because of what he's done for us. Go ahead and open your Bibles or take out that sheet of paper you've got on the way in. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to be at tonight. Um, it is the Advent season. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Um, it's kind of an old traditional church word. But Advent means appearing. Advent means um, the coming of something. Something you've been waiting on has now come. And so if you think about that in terms of Christmas, we're waiting, right? The, the people of God were waiting for Christ. They were waiting for the Messiah. And his coming into the world is the advent um, of the Savior. It's the appearing of the Savior. And so Christians for centuries have celebrated this season as one of waiting, as one of prayer, as one of repentance. And we're ultimately, we are waiting not for the first coming of Jesus. Now we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. So we still are waiting for God to fulfill his promises. And it's really, a, it's a season where you can reflect upon um, really what God is doing in your life. And here's the, the question I want you to ask yourself um, as we go through this text is, what are you waiting on God to do in your life? Have you ever thought about that? What are you waiting on God to do? Or maybe you're waiting on a prayer to be answered. Maybe you're waiting on... Uh, this season of life to change. Maybe you're waiting on a new job or you're waiting on a new place to live or a new relationship, whatever it may be. Maybe, you know, some kind of spiritual change within because you're trying to overcome sin or, or know God more. What are you waiting on God to do is what I want you to think about tonight as we look at Luke chapter 2. And I pray that the Lord will speak to you through his word. Luke 2, beginning in verse 22. It says this, And when the time came... For their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him, that is the baby Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now here's what I want you to see, and this is the man we're going to focus on this text. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who lives, and it's because he lives, Lord, that we can have hope and joy for tomorrow. And even today, we have hope and joy in our hearts. Today, I pray as we look at this passage of scripture, help us to understand what it means to wait upon the Lord to act. To wait upon you for your perfect timing. For whatever it is, Lord, you have caused us and determined us to wait. We all, Lord, are waiting for the return of your son, the establishment of your kingdom. And we long for that day, Lord. We also are waiting for you to perhaps do certain works in our lives. We, we pray that you would reveal to us by your spirit, Lord, what you um, would have to teach us tonight. So help me to do that, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you think about it, we're all waiting on something. And if you're asking, how is this relevant to my recovery and what I'm trying to accomplish in this program, it's relevant because everybody in here, to some degree or another, you're waiting on God to do something. You're waiting on God to act. I mean, if you think about life, all of life is a waiting period at certain points, you know. And when you're a kid, you can't wait to be older. Just ask my seven-year-old daughter who's going on 16. Uh, 
when you're in school. You can't wait to graduate and, and move on. When you're perhaps single, you can't wait until you find a spouse and then have kids or get a job, a career, or financial situation that you desperately want. If you're towards the end of your career, you can't wait to a point where you can retire and you don't have to work anymore. And then all of us, if you stop and think about it, we're waiting on the day until we breathe our last and it's our last day. Everyone is waiting. We're waiting on the next season, the next something in our life. And here's the deal. There are two ways you can wait. You can either wait joyfully or you can wait fearfully. You can either wait with hope and expectation or you can be afraid of what's to come. And it's all determined depending on the object of your waiting. What are you waiting for? And so here's, give me a little bit of an example here. Consider if you're waiting in the lobby of a bank and you know you're going to get a check for $100,000, that's pretty exciting. And you're going to be waiting with joy and anticipation, okay? Because you know the object of your waiting is a very good thing. So if it's a good outcome, you're going to wait with joy. But imagine you're waiting in the lobby of an emergency room. And you're waiting on the doctor to tell you whether or not your loved one made it in a car crash. Well, that's the type of waiting that's done with fear. It's done being afraid. And so the object of your waiting determines whether or not you wait with joy or you wait with fear. And so tonight, if you're here and you're kind of, you know, what's the future hold for me? What's the next step? What's the next season of life going to look like for me? If you are not following and trusting Christ and and trusting your life to Christ, then your waiting is a season of fear. And it's a season of uncertainty. Because you don't know what the future holds. But if you're here tonight and you have entrusted yourself to the Lord, then you can wait with joy because yet same with the other group. You might not know what the future holds, but you know the one who holds the future. And there's a big difference. And so you can either wait for God to act and move you into whatever next season you're hoping to move into with joy, or you can do it without faith and do it with fear. And what I want you to get in your minds tonight is that those who wait on the Lord are blessed. Those who wait in faith for God to act are blessed. The context of our passage tonight is the birth of Christ. I don't know if you realize that. Luke chapter 2, Jesus has just been born in Bethlehem. Right? This is the Christmas season, so it's appropriate for us to talk about this. Jesus has just been born. The angels of God appeared and they began singing glory to God in the highest. Actually, you see that in verse 13. After the Son of God appears, the the angels of God worship His Son. It says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. This is the night the people of God had been waiting on for centuries. They had been waiting for the appearing of their Savior and now it has come. And now that He's come, it brings us to this passage where there's a man in the temple who's particularly been waiting on this day because God told him through the Holy Spirit he would not die until he saw the Messiah. I mean, that's an incredible promise. So he's been waiting for the day that the Christ would appear, that the Son of God would appear, because he knew he would not taste death until that day came. So it brings us to verse 22. Mary and Joseph... Bring the boy Jesus, the baby Jesus, to the temple. And it says, when the time had come for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And they're, they're going there according to the law. So according to Jewish law, Mary, she had to go and, and offer sacrifices for purification. Anytime a woman in Israel had a child, they had to offer sacrifices. It was a reminder of sin and uncleanliness. They also had to offer their son to the Lord, a dedication. Now, not, not offer like a sacrifice, but dedicate them. This morning we had child, children dedicated to the Lord here in our church. We had up on this stage dozens of men and women and their children, and they dedicated their children to the Lord, saying, we will raise our children to the Lord. And in Israel, your firstborn had to be dedicated to the Lord as holy. And that's what they're doing here. And all this is being done according to the law of Moses because Jesus, in his mission, had to come and fulfill the law in perfect righteousness. That was part of his salvific mission. A part of his mission was not just to die for sinners, but a major part of his mission was to live a life of perfect righteousness because we can't do that. By the way, if you're here tonight and you think, i got to get my life right with God and I need to start behaving and acting right, just 
just stop where you're at because that's not going to happen. What you need is the righteousness of Christ. What you need is to put your trust in the one who earned righteousness before God and can enable you to stand before God with perfect holiness by faith in him. Don't, don't try to stand before God on your own two feet and your own works because it just doesn't work out that way. What you need is Christ and his righteousness. And that's part of what he's doing here. Now look at verse 25. We, we come to the man I want you to look at in this text. It's Simeon. And verse 25 tells you everything you need to know about him. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. There's four things said about this man. He's righteous, which means he walked in the ways of the Lord. He wasn't perfect, but he he obeyed God. He trusted God. He was devout, which means he feared God. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, which means he's waiting eagerly for the Messiah to come. He's in a period of waiting. And it also says the Holy Spirit was upon him. And he was waiting in verse 26 until the day the Christ would come. He knew that day wouldn't come until he died. Verse 26 says it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And that day's come. Imagine how many days he, he looked down the hall of the temple to see, is this the day? Is this the day the Lord has promised? And now the day has come. And they see Jesus coming into the temple. In verse 27 it says this, And he, that Simeon, came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents had brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms. So Simeon takes the little baby, who's only about eight days old, because according to the law, they had to go up to the temple after eight days circumcision, actually probably about 40 days in this period, and they had to present them to the Lord. This is an infant in the arms of Simeon. And it says, he took him, And this is what he said. He blessed God. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. If you're wondering tonight what salvation is, it's Jesus. Jesus is salvation. If you're looking for a a list of things to do or some directions on how to better your life, uh, that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about a person. Christianity is about the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is salvation. Everything you need to be right with God is in him and can be accessed by you through faith. He says, let now your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, the light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. After all this waiting, God had fulfilled his promise. And so for the remainder of our time, I just want to take a few moments with you and talk about exactly what does it mean to wait upon the Lord? What does that mean to wait upon the Lord? How do we wait upon the Lord? And and then really, why should we wait upon the Lord? Am I supposed to just think about what does it mean to wait upon God? Am I just supposed to sit on my hands and do nothing? I mean, I'm waiting on God to to act in my life, to change things for me. Am I just supposed to sit around and do nothing? Well, no, that's not how the people of God have waited upon the Lord throughout all of redemptive history. Waiting upon God is waiting in hope that God will act in your life. That's what it means to wait upon God. I mean, going all the way back to the garden... When the man and woman first sinned, God promised, after he cursed them and judged them, he promised he was going to send one to crush the head of the serpent. And for all of redemptive history, up to the day that the Christ was born, the people of God were waiting for the serpent crusher. They were waiting for the one who would crush the head of Satan. You think about Abraham and Sarah. When God came to Abraham and said, you're going to have a son and many descendants, you know how many years it was until he finally had Isaac? 25 years, he was waiting for God to fulfill his promise. David was told that there would be a descendant who sat upon his throne for all eternity, and David never saw that descendant. So waiting on God is taking God's promises and believing them, and then waiting in hope for them to be fulfilled. And for Christians, that's the return of Christ. That's the return to establish his kingdom. And we wait and we long for that day. But maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're waiting for God to do something very specific. You've been praying. 
You've been asking, and you're waiting on God to do something. First of all, I want you to know that in many cases, we don't ask for the right things. We're asking God to to do certain things in our lives, to change certain things, and maybe the reason he hasn't done it yet is because he's not going to do it. And if he doesn't do it, then you can be sure that like a good father, he's not going to give you something that's going to harm you. You know, my daughter is seven, and I will do anything for her, but within reason. If she asks for something foolish or for something I know is going to harm her, I'm not going to give her that thing. And it's not because I, love, I don't love her, it's because I love her. And oftentimes, we're waiting on God to do something. We want God to change something, but God's saying, I'm not going to do that for you, because if I did that for you, do you realize what you would do with your life? But maybe God is going to answer your prayer in the way that you want, but he's making you wait. He's making you be patient. So the question I want you to think about now is, how do I wait on God? What does that mean, to wait on God to act? And I just want you to think about Simeon and how Simeon waited. And think about, number one, Simeon waited in faith. So waiting on God doesn't mean I just sit around passively and I don't do anything. Waiting on God means I'm trusting in God to do what he's promised to do. And here's something God has promised to do in you if you're trusting Christ, is to make you more like Christ. If you're waiting on God to change you and to enable you to walk more faithfully with him, then he promises he'll do that. Think about what David says. And and when we wait, we wait believing. Psalm 27, David says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. David says, I believe in my waiting. So that leads to another way we wait on God, and that is we wait in hope. So if you're waiting in faith, then faith will actually give birth to hope. And hope is the confidence that we have in God that God will act. It's waiting in faith. And so if I tell my daughter that I'm going to, after school, we're going to go, and I was talking to her about this earlier. I'm going to pick you up, we're going to go to the park, we're going to get ice cream. And so she waits, and she knows her daddy's going to make good on that promise, because in When it's according to my power, I don't break my word to her. And so she waits knowing I'm going to do for her exactly what I said. And you know how she waits? She waits hopefully. Because when you wait believing the promises of God, you wait with hope. So maybe you're waiting for a day when there'll be no more pain and suffering, there'll be no death, disease, because you have experienced so much tragedy in your life and you're waiting for a day when all that will be made right and be made new You can wait with hope knowing Christ is going to return to do that. Maybe you have been wronged in this life. Maybe people have sinned against you grievously. God doesn't promise that righteousness and and justice will occur in this life, but he does promise that when he returns, vengeance will be his. And you can wait with hope knowing that whatever's been done to you that's been wronged, he will make right. And so we wait believing those promises. That means we can wait with hope. But we also have to wait patiently. Because God acts on his timing and not our own. I know that when we ask God to do something, we want it done yesterday. We want what we want when we want it, right? That's just how we are. I pray and I think God should answer my prayer immediately. And you think about Simeon, God did not act in Simeon's time, he acted in his time. And here's the thing, and here's what you need to remember. God is never early and God is never late. God is always on time. His times are perfect. If he was to give it to you too early, it would not be as beneficial for you. And he's never going to delay and make you wait longer than he intended. His time is perfect, but you have to be patient to wait on God. Which means while you're waiting, you not only wait prayerfully, you wait hopefully, you wait patiently. You know what you can do? You can wait prayerfully. Seek the Lord. While you're waiting on God to act in your life, don't just sit on your hands. Pray. And seek God. Listen to what Micah said. Micah 7, 7. He says, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. While we wait, we pray. And here's a final thing I want you to think about. While you wait, you serve him. And this is going to be really hard for you to hear. This is hard for me to write this. As I was writing this very next thing I'm getting ready to tell you, it convicted me. 
while you wait on God, you serve him in the station of life in which he has you, even if that station is the one that you're wanting to be delivered from. God, I'm ready to be done in this phase in life. And he says, I want you to wait patiently. And you know what you need to do? Serve me in that spot that you want to be done with. Serve me there. And maybe God wants to see if you'll be faithful where you're at before he brings you to the next spot. Because why would he bring you into the next season of life that you desire if you're not going to be faithful where you are? Prayerfully, hopefully, patiently, and faithfully. And if you do that, there are many benefits to waiting on God. The scripture has lots of promises for people who await on God in faith. Number one, God will renew your strength. Isaiah 40 verse 30 says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But listen to this. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. So sometimes we can grow weary while we're waiting on God. I'm growing impatient, but I'm also growing tired. But those who wait on the Lord with hope and faith and prayer, he will give you new strength. And sometimes that strength comes in the form of contentment and joy and peace, even in the season of life you're wanting to be done with. And that brings the second thing he brings is tranquility or, or peace. Well, oftentimes we wait anxiously. You know, if you're waiting on someone to show up somewhere and you're looking at the watch and you're wondering why aren't they here yet, you start to have some anxiety. Are we going to be late? And sometimes when we're waiting on God, we can do so with anxiety. Psalm 37 reminds us to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So the one you're waiting on to act is actually the one you go to for rest. The one you're waiting on to intervene in your life, you go to him for your peace while you wait. And while you wait, he promises blessings. Isaiah 30 says, "Those or Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed. Blessed are all who wait for him. You want to be blessed by God? Wait on him to act. Wait on God to act. Lamentations 3 says that the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Now listen, I say all this, and it sounds good on paper, it sounds good in a sermon, but I know that it's hard. I know that it's challenging, we want things to happen in our timing, we grow tired, we grow weary, we're ready for God to do something in our lives. But here's what I want you to remember, is that God does not operate according to your schedule and timing, he operates according to his. God is the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, his plans are infinitely wise, and he is not going to be moved at all because we're ready for him to act. He acts according to his will and plans. God is there to help you, but he's not a cosmic bellhop ready to just come at the snap of your fingers. God is merciful and he's ready to give you assistance. He wants to do that, but remember, it is his plans and his timing. I know in my own life, if I had gotten what I asked from God on times when I was ready to rush him, it would not have turned out well for me. I I can think of so many instances. When I was single... And I was hoping that a relationship would come my way. You know, I was like, Lord, maybe I'll marry her. Maybe I'll marry this one, Lord. And I was hoping that a woman would come into my life, and I was praying for that. And I'm so glad that God didn't give me what I was asking for because then I wouldn't have my wife. When I was ready for a career to start, I wanted to go into law enforcement. That was always my dream. And I applied to be into law enforcement, and I got denied, and I was crushed. And I'm so glad God crushed my dreams and timings because then he rerouted me into Bible college and ministry. And that's what God has called me to do. For five years, my wife and I, we wanted a child. We were ready to be parents and we couldn't get pregnant. And so we tried to go into foster care and adoption and God didn't allow those things to happen. And I'm so glad he made us wait because now we have a daughter that we absolutely cherish. At my last church, there were several weeks where I would have a rough week and I'd look for other ministry positions. And it always worked out where when I was ready to leave, there was nothing 
being offered, and when there was things being offered, I wasn't ready to leave. And I'm so glad that none of it ever worked out because I might not have the job I have now, which I absolutely love. Waiting on God is not always easy, but it is in our best interest. Because if God were to give you what you wanted every single time, you would make a train wreck of your life. That's guaranteed. And God works not only in his timing, but in his ways. And he might not give you what you want, but he will give you what you need. This is why God tells us, and Jesus tells us, ask anything you want in my name and I'll give it to you. You know what that means? It's not that we just add Jesus' name to the end of our prayers. He says, ask me whatever you want in my name, that I would stamp my name on that. That I put my, my approval on that prayer. You know, if you're asking for God to, to make you a millionaire next week, I don't know if Jesus is going to put his name on that. But Jesus says, if you pray according to my will, I'll do whatever you ask. But that includes waiting on God, and that includes trusting God. It includes believing, you know what, he, he's a good father in heaven. And I don't know all of his plans, but I know that he's going to take care of me. We wait for God, and that's how the people of God for for centuries, and they're still doing it today, have waited on God. From the time in the garden to today, the people of God have always waited on the Lord to act in his timing. And when we wait, we wait with hope. We wait with joy. And one day, all of our waiting. No matter what your circumstances are, what you're waiting on right now, all of your waiting will be over. Because Christ is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And friends, that's the most important thing you should be waiting for. We talk about all these earthly things and listen, jobs and and living situations, financial situations, relationships, whatever it may be that you want to change, all that very important but there's nothing more important than making sure that your life is right with God and really what are you really wanting God to do in your life are you wanting God to act in your life so that you can get what you want are you wanting God to act in your life so that you can live more closely according to his will and his plans and is your ultimate waiting just a better life or your ultimate waiting To be with Christ. That's what the people of God wait for. Is for the appearing of the son. He already came once and he came as a lowly baby in a manger. That's not how he's going to come the next time. He's going to appear in the clouds with great glory and power. And he's going to come for two reasons. One, the salvation of his people. For those who love and trust him, he is going to take them to be with himself. But he's also coming for another reason, and that is the judgment of his enemies. And so tonight, you're waiting on one of two things. To be in eternal joy with Jesus, or to face his judgment for all eternity. So I would ask you, what are you waiting for? You're waiting on Christ You're waiting on something in this life to be fulfilled. What is it you're waiting on the Lord to do? Let's pray. Lord, we we long for the day when there'll be no need for sermons like this. There'll be no need for struggles to be remedied, for hurts to be bounded up. Lord, you will come and make all things new and pray that you would put a deep longing in our hearts for that day, that everything we do in this life would be reoriented to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would live in light of that day, the great and awesome day that is approaching, and we are closer to it than we've ever been. And I pray, Lord, that there may be people that are waiting on you to do certain things, and I ask God that you would help them understand if it's according to your will or not. Help us understand if we're pursuing the right things, and that just takes a reorienting of our, of our spiritual eyes to be on, on Christ and his, his will and not so much our own. So give us discernment, Lord, and I pray if there's anyone here tonight that is far from you, Lord, that does not know or trust your son, I pray that you would bring them near. We ask it in his name. Amen. All right, we're going to go to our classes.